Hello and welcome back to Football Gantron, the only English language podcast dedicated to Armenian football. Uh, Adam here, joined by Chadens and Anamen for our first episode of 2023. Happy new, new Year! New Year, new me. Um, gentlemen, how are you doing? New Year. I don't know if it's happy, but New Year, everyone. Chadens, how are things with you? All good. Let's see. Uh, you know, a lot of exciting games coming up. A lot of uh, you know action, new European Bro. games. Everything. You know, everything's new in a way. Yeah. Boring yes. New Year, I would say. Yeah, a, a lot of things haven't started up for us yet. Um, they're newly starting to actually, as of recording, uh, a bunch of players are restarting their league campaign. So hopefully, the interest gets there. But we will start first at home in Armenia, uh, where the Armenian Premier League is not back in action yet. It actually won't be back in action for another month or so. Um, <laughs> yeah, less than a month in a way. Yeah, less than um, a month. Not much. But until then, we sh- uh, uh, thought maybe take a quick look at what the standings are looking like right now. Uh, we have FC Urardu at first place with 47 points followed closely behind uh, by Adara Armenia, who are on 43 points. Um, Punic is even further down um, in third place with 34 points. So that's the top three currently right now. Um, and it's looking like a two-horse race between Urardu and Adara Armenia. Uh, elsewhere at the bottom of the table, we have FC Noah on the bottom with 12 points, with uh, Bekma right above them on 13 so that seems to be the relegation battle while the rest are yeah. in the middle. Yeah, it's already pack. clear. Um, before the start of the season, um, or the restart of the season, rather, uh, the January transfer window, which is currently open right now, but will be shut the day this episode comes out. Um, and some teams are making some moves, uh, specifically at the top of the table. Uh, let's start with that one, Chadens. Urardu making a couple of big move signings so oh, far yeah. this uh, this January. Who do you who who did they bring in? So the the there's two huge names. Uh, hu- one is huge in football. The other one is huge uh, in Armenian football. One is Yaya Sanogo, who has previously played for Ajax, uh, who has previously played for Crystal Palace, who has won FA Cup and Community Shield with Arsenal, who are leading the Premier League. And the other player, the Armenian player, who's a huge name, many of them are also uh, featured in Ajax, is Arazos Bilis, uh, who joined from Punic. Ziaia Sanogo uh, was out without football for 18 to 20 months, so he joined on a free transfer basis, free agent basis. I think he was um, waiting for the right team to come along. That's why he waited over 18 months. No better team yeah. than the Lions, then. I read he had um, I read he had interest from French second division clubs, um, and Saudi Arabian clubs, and uh, one other the place. The ACL. I, I can't remember, but 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 somehow I mean, con- considering. Think? Yeah, considering the current climate of football, you think you would go to Saudi Arabia because that's where everyone's going to make, you know, make good money. Um, but dope. he ended up in Urardu. But ha- ha- so these two signings, um, let's just stop here for a sec because the Urardu are top of the table. How much of an impact Armen do you think it's going to make uh, for the rest of their campaign? Do you think this is enough for them given that they have a mix of, you know, domestic players, uh, good young Armenian players, um, and now you're bringing in the experience of Osbilis, you're bringing in Yaya Sanogo, who we everyone knows is a talent that just never lived up to expectations. Do you anticipate this being enough for Urardu to seal the deal? You, you gave me the... I mean, I, you said was what I was going to say. It was what they were missing, like... Uh, the one thing that they needed to uh, 
get it to make it through and and win the championship three see it, see it through you know and and for them to have an actual cause in europe and and have actual expectations was uh one or two in this case uh solid experienced players with with european top notch experience i mean yeah it, they didn't play in real madrid but ara did win uh at uh the dutch league uh netherlands and was scouted by Manchester United before his uh, career wrecking injury. Uh, so we're talking about a player that, like, uh, no more exp- explanation needed, in my opinion. Like, both of them are super experienced and super awesome to have as assets. And naturally, Aras not fit to play more than uh, 30 minutes a game, but that's about enough. Even in Europe, like, Hell, we're going to go into the national team later on, but I have my reasons to believe why Aras would be a good asset for for the new income and new national team. And Sanogo, well, that's your number nine for Europe, period. Yeah, so the, the, so the, the, the composition of this Urardu team, they have that Armenian core of Narek Grigorian, Aras Aryan, uh, Sergei Mekarchian, Razarian, who has come, I, I would Jiram say, in this Margarian, first... captain. Jiram Margarian, captain. But uh, Razarian, who's, who's kind of become like the new, what what may be another yeah. good young central defensive option. And you're complementing these players with uh, uh, good experienced players. I think that's, that's a winning formula to me. Mm-hmm. It is. Move, moving on to another big... Um, APL signing. Arthur Kartashian, friend of the show, uh, has left Olympiakos Nicosia and signed with FC Vaughn in the Armenian Premier League. Uh, so he has left Cyprus. Uh, he is back in the motherland. Um, Chadens, being our resident Cypriot, you watch a lot of uh, the Cypriot League. Um, we know Kartashian's reason for leaving wasn't football related uh but was there anything else that you read or that you saw that could have contributed to him deciding to leave cyprus because he was playing well right um on an individual level maybe on a team level not so great uh the 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 from what i know it was uh the wages the the salaries basically some were saying the salaries were normal but the club is not in a good situation i've i've heard from one or two players within the club who have uh, admitted that it's not on a good basis uh it was in much better situations in the previous years before so uh, could be most likely i believe it's personal reasons but obviously, the club situation played a role. Well, now he is back in the Armenian Premier League, uh, where he can probably help Vaughn make a little bit of a push. Vaughn are currently sitting in fifth place, smack dab in the center of the table on 27 points. They are seven points behind um, Alashkert, who are right above them. So... You know, considering they have, what, Movsisyan as their striker and he's been in good form, I, I think, I think you know, this will be good. I, I hope that it's enough, um, you know, he gets just plays every game, which I'm sure he will, uh, and, and gets a national team call-up because I would love to see him. I would love to see um, Ghazarian and I would love to see Stiopa Mukherjian fight for a center back spot. I think that those are three good young central defenders that can make, um, you know, that, that can strengthen our national team back line. Um, anyway, moving forward, another good transfer. Uh, Yerjani Grubasarian left the Bekma to go to Noah, the former German under 17 captain and current, uh, Armenian under 21. I don't even know if he's still under 21. We've been talking about this guy for so long. Uh, is is oh he is <laughs> is 
with FC Noah. Now Noah, as we know, have have, have switched gears from becoming a um, mercenary hiring side to one that is trying to develop um, young Armenian talent. Um, so we see this gentleman. I'll, I'll let you say your opinions. But to me, this seems like a, a good a good solid win of a signing that may help Noah get out of this rut that they're in. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, uh, speaking of financially compromised, so to speak, clubs, uh, not just Olympiagos Nicosia, but this is a phenomenon we see very commonly in Armenian football. Noah is actually uh, at one of those positions, which translates into them being at the bottom of the table. Um, and sticking to football strictly now, uh, it's interesting to see Yachani go from the one of the two teams fighting for relegation to the other. Uh, but I was going to mention, actually, that both Bukama and Noah are two clubs that we like because of this, because of how centered they are uh, around Armenian youth, right, and developing uh, players. Uh, but at least one, only one of them gets to be relegated. But I really like this kid. Another option for the three uh, young setup backs that you were mentioning. Thing is, uh, again, kind of flirting with uh, talking about the national team a little bit now. Uh, I, I, one of the problems that I see, one of the many problems, <laughs> Uh, is that they let uh, players, informed players, slip. And like they don't call them up most of the time when they're informed. And this has happened countless times, especially when Noah was informed. They should have called like five of their players, and they barely called Ararat for some reason. Uh, but, but I think the FFA and everyone listening to this should be paying more attention to teams like Noah, Urartu, Bukama. Hopefully, we get to see Yachanik play much more than he did at Bukama. Yeah, and, and being in a defensive midfield role, which is somewhere that we're lacking, you know, in the national team picture. Oh, yeah, picture. he can play at the midfield. That's true. That, 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 yeah. that's true. So, one to keep an eye on for the second half of the season. Um, next up is a transfer of sorts, but Eric Vardanyan has decided to call it quits on his career. Uh, the former okay. La Masia product who spent five years in Barcelona um, decided, you know, he just couldn't do it anymore after needing another surgery. Uh, and he has decided that he will no longer be playing professional football. Uh, he has decided to join the Urardu coaching staff, if I'm not mistaken, and he will yeah, be... scouting report, uh, scouting, uh, scouting position from scouting. what I believe. Yeah. yeah. So he will be, you know, in 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 a front office capacity or a sideline capacity. Uh, it, it sucks because you know he's a player that I think we've we've talked about a, a lot on the show. Um, he's good. He's he was ex- extremely talented, but again. <laughs> He got hit with the and injury. And Robert Arzumania said he was uh, he's one of the best he's seen. Yeah, and it, that just tells you. It's so just, it's uh, La Masia. That that's all you need to say. La Masia. We have ne- we have not had a, a player since him go to La Masia. So sucks. He so his career ended um, with a total of. Well, professionally speaking, 96 games, 16 goals, 14 assists. So that's 30 goal contributions, which is about one goal in every three games. With the national team, he appeared for, with Armenia 10 times, um, and but he had only managed to score one goal, uh, which was against and Belarus. And yeah, which was against Belarus. And he, that was an avenue. If you go watch that goal, it was like this missile from outside the box um but yeah. yeah it's it's a it's a it's a really sad story because he's a player that really could have been something moving on 
to to lift the mood even more, uh, Armenian national team starting goalkeeper David Yurchenko was <laughs> let go by Punic uh, and currently does not have a club. Um, putting us in a little bit of a conundrum here because as is, we don't have a lot of goalkeeping options. And now transfer we're looking market at... Not yet. Transfer um, market isn't... Well, he's a free agent, so that doesn't really matter. But it th- doesn't change the fact that we don't have oh, a good goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I want to this- say something. Say this tweet. Uh... He's gonna sign for Radu. That's my thing. He's gonna mm. look. He signed for Alasker right before they went into Europe. Signed for Punic right before they went into Europe group stages. He's gonna do the same for the third time in a row. I'm telling you, for Urartu, no, you no less. I'm yeah, I'm like counting on this. Yeah, probably, but it's it's also still a little concerning that we literally do not have any goalkeeping options. It's like <laughs> and who are actually below thirty? Yeah, who are below and thirty? Bro, that point you mentioned brings me back to what I just mentioned like five minutes ago or something. Uh, that how the FFA and and the national team in general let informed players slip. And this is even more important when it comes to like uber sensitive positions for us, like goalkeepers or center, uh, central defenders or defensive mids. Now we're talking goalkeepers. Uh, two goalkeepers that were informed last season or the season before that, uh, that the FFA should have called. I'm not saying start them because you had your Shanko, that's true, but call them up. It was going to create a virtual cycle. For the player, national team, and their clubs, respectively, Felix Ferayan or Felix Ferayan and uh, Grigori Matevosian. Like those two goalies are young. They were in form. The FFA let them slip, like ignored him completely. They lost form. And now we're in the same spot over again. I, I've been seeing, although, um, some people on the Armenian national team subreddit who follow the APL have pointed out on several occasions that uh, via Sheslav Grigorian, yeah, Artach, who, yeah, who plays for uh, Lernayn Artsakh, uh, has been in pretty good form, honestly. Uh, he represented the team PFL in Russia under 20, uh, but he has been in Armenia for some time now, and he has uh, played... Player, yeah, he, yeah, he's so in 20 matches, he's conceded 20 goals, but he has kept five clean sheets. Um, and considering where Artsakh are on the table, um, I was gonna go there, yeah, it's not that bad of a conversion rate, honestly. That's impressive. Yeah, it is impressive. Like so, I mean, the one keeping Artsakh off the relegation battle. Yeah, exactly. So uh, to me, it's like, you know what, maybe I'm not saying take the gamble starting versus um, Turkey because that, that would be suicide. We need to start someone experienced versus Turkey. It's, it's And it probably should be Yurchenko. But um, like we said, you know, we have that friendly against Cyprus after these are the, this is what this needs to be for, you know, bringing in these types of players. Field. Yeah, I don't want to be a bus field. I do see it. I do see the the point, and I I agree. I just don't see the FFA calling him up. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I'm not optimistic on this front, at least. Yeah, it's 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 hard to be. I I, yeah, but, I, I agree. Well, we we yeah, a lot of national team uh, topics coming up. So. Oh, well. Wait. Speaking of the national team, uh, let us move on to our second topic of the episode, which is our players abroad. And we will start first with our golden boy, Eduard Sversian, whose name has been showing up a lot in this transfer window. And this is where you put, like, godly music. Like, oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, so he has been um, linked with several clubs, including uh, Fiorentina, PSV Eindhoven, um, 
Uh, what was the other Dutch club? Feyenoord. Feyenoord. Uh, did I say Fiorentina already? Sevilla was another yeah. one that we saw uh, put out there. Sevilla, Villarreal, in Spain, Sevilla, Villarreal. And actually, Real Madrid, they didn't deny it, which actually tells you something. Of course, he's not going to be starting for them, but they, he's more than good enough for uh, like to sign for Real Madrid uh, and start for every other club you mentioned. I I do see why he would go to Sevilla, but uh, he's more than good enough to start for them, even though they're not doing all that well at the moment. Um, apparently, 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 the latest uh, update on the battle for him, even though he like there's still six months to go until he just he makes his decision. So dozens of clubs expected to join and leave the battle for him. One of the teams that, did, at least for now, seems to be withdrawing for the battle is Fiore, Fiorentina, precisely. Uh, but I don't know, bro. We haven't even mentioned the interest from Germany. Uh, Milken Gladbach is interested and has always been interested. thing is, of course, no major news are going to come now, unless for some reason... One of those clubs decides to make an offer so good for him to refuse uh, the Godfather style uh, and for him to make him change his mind and, and leave straight away. But he is almost set up and, and his mind is set up to leave in six months. Uh, there are still two to three Bundesliga clubs undisclosed interested uh, in talks with him. Uh, Schalke had this happen in the past. Wolfsburg happened in the past. Uh, so I it wouldn't be crazy uh, for some of those clubs to still be interested. It's it's gonna be uh, carnage. It's gonna be savage. It's a literally fight against everyone for him. Yeah, we. I don't think this is gonna be. Um, I think this is gonna be something that oh, we've never all. experienced as as for an Armenian player. You know. So many clubs mm-hmm. fighting for his signature. When it came with Henrik, we we knew there was like interest, but the the decision seemed kind of easy for him. You know, they seemed like no brainers. But this one is going to be a very interesting one to keep tabs on because he's still very young. He's only 22, um, and this next step that he makes is going to be very important. You know, it's going to be his first and time I leaving like, Russia. Yeah, I like that each team has like. Some thing, some argument they're trying to win him over with. Like PSV, they're kind of weak in my opinion, but they win him over with the, the youth development, with playing with a Champions League group stages. And, and then you got your, I don't know, Marseille, Monaco, they have the money. And then you got your Sevilla, Fiorentina, that they have pedigree and tradition. And it's like, ooh, it's so interesting to see what is, Edo going to prioritize like uh, then rotation is he going to pick a team where he's going to be a bench player is he going to be choosing a team where he's going to be starting it's going to be super interesting in that front and and like I said for every for every club we we know about their interest there are three clubs we don't so I think this is only a fraction of the clubs that are actually interested in Edo and that have shown interest i guaranteed um but so it's gonna be interesting like you said he's probably not gonna leave this winter uh we would know by the time this episode comes out if he was um but looking like it's gonna be a very interesting summer uh for mr sebastian uh next up henrik mokitarian uh Charens has been doing pretty good so far for Inter not on the statistical front uh he hasn't been scoring or assisting because he's playing this much weirder deeper role uh but the trophies keep coming right Chalens? sure Mkhitaryan doesn't stop with the trophies uh (laughs) Super Cup win he he got it last week as of this recording was it last week or a week and a half ago um uh, they beat Milan so it was a Milan derby in a way uh, 3 nil, a uh, huge score. Another trophy to add to the list. That I mean, that says that says it all. 
you know yeah. Mkhitaryan, most people know him, even uh, people outside of the Armenian circle know him. So this is another achievement for him. Yeah, people people are calling him a Super Cup merchant because he's won the Armenian Super Cup three times. He's won the Ukrainian Super Cup once. He's won the Italian Super Cup now. And he also won the German Super Cup twice while he was with Borussia Dortmund. Um, so the Italian I mean, fans the, on Instagram, they were like <laughs> commenting. Star. What were they saying? They were like, they were like Armenian train. Armenian train. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's going to go uh, probably near his Europa League and Europa Conference League winners medals that he has. Maybe he can add a Champions League one to it. Who knows? Um, moving on. Stiopa Makurchian, the Armenian national team central defender, had a trial with Nizhny Novgorod, uh, FCNN, or HH, whatever. They recently rebranded or something. They got bought by a company. I use the term bought loosely because this is Russia. Um, <laughs> he went there on trial and was subsequently injured but um, and recently came back to Armenia. Um, Armen, you and I have discussed this at length and um, have voiced our disapproval uh, about this move. Um, not that any, anything is, is certain at this moment because Nizhny said that they are going to think about whether or not they want to sign him, uh, which to me tells me that they're not going to sign him. Um, one, I'm offended that he even need to, needed to go on trial. But two, I'm glad that he did because now it means he's probably not going to go there. Yeah, I mean, you you used a good word there. Uh, you're offended. And I think that was partly uh, the whole point behind having him go on trial and uh, uh, all on top of everything, uh, the club and mid-table Russian club, like uh, deciding whether or not they want him. Uh, he is, for everyone that's watched Armenian national team um, games, Armenian or not, uh, most people see what we see in him, that he's way too good to go for a mid-table Russian club. Like, he should go to... Uh, first and foremost, he doesn't... Like, he has voiced, uh, like, explicitly that he didn't want to go to Russia and instead he wants to pursue a career in Central or Western Europe because he wants to make top five uh, leagues uh, sooner rather than later. And... We believe in him. We we know he has what it takes to do that, and I think the whole reason of them try having them having him try out there and all that was to like tease him, like make him pay for those statements, uh, and and make the Armenian Federation pay to well the new coach appointment, the head coach appointment we're gonna talk about. Because football and politics do mix, uh, although they shouldn't, they do. Uh, because football, more than a sport, is also a business. Uh, unfortunately, we know this by now. And I feel like they're trying to taunt us. And, and Stupa is way too good for them. Luckily, we have to see through all the BS, excuse my French, and focus on the fact that, as you mentioned, he's uh, back in Yerevan. They were supposed to announce by the today, literally, uh, their final decision, their, their club, Nathan Nogorod. And the fact that so far no news have come may mean that they're not signing him. He's staying put at Ararat Armenia that is fighting for the APL title and naturally European spot. And that's good news for us, especially since apparently it's a light injury. So he's definitely going to make uh, the national team camp in two months, I think. So we're good. Yeah. Moving on to another Still place. That, yeah. <laughs> Moving well, on to this drop, but like, uh, what was, um, uh, the, he was, there was also a player with him. Uh, I think Sevitan, it was Sevitan. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But he played like he was signed. 
that this is interesting. You mentioned it because he signed for that club like literally a few weeks after he stated that he was uh, about to get his Armenian citizenship. Well, he didn't get the Armenian citizenship and now plays for that club. Um, but we, we honestly we have a lot of wingers like him. He's good. He's clearly good. Like uh, played La Liga and everything. But luckily, it's not as necessary as Stupa. Speaking of necessary, Sargis Adamian is not getting the necessary game time we would like him to get at FC Köln. Um, he, since the restart of the Bundesliga, has been on the bench uh, in consecutive games and has not made an appearance off the bench, making him the, based on my math, seventh string attacker. Um, and given the way that FC Köln have played in the restart with a, I think it was a 7-1 win and then a 1-1 draw with Bayern, it doesn't look like Sokka is going to be getting on the pitch anytime soon. Um which is interesting because he yeah. did play in a majority of the, the, the friendlies that they were having. Um, and, and he was getting solid game time uh, in the first half of the season. So not sure what really happened there, but something to keep an eye on considering that he is our, our most talented central forward. And our, I think the best center forward that we do have in Armenia and um, obviously one of our two players playing in a top league. So it's it's a little frustrating to see. But hopefully he, he can work his way back. recently become a daddy? Uh, I don't know if he recently became one or if his wife is pregnant. I think his wife is pregnant. I don't think I don't think they've delivered the kids. Yeah, the, been, his wife is pregnant. Yeah. That's Dave, been a huge issue for him. Like, what's happening? What What's happened on or in his personal life? has always affected his game for better or worse. So that might have to do with it. Uh, I don't think so because this isn't him. This is this is this is the coach not picking him. That's the, this that's the problem. No, here. But it wouldn't make sense because he wouldn't be in the squad if that was the case. He wouldn't be in the but squad. The, the yeah. coach knows him from his time at Hoffenheim. He was like uh, the, the assistant coach or something. And he liked him, and he's uh, one of the main reasons why he went there. Like uh, they, they, they like each other and and and, and know each other very well. He actually Baumgart uh, or whatever his name is asked for him to to sign him from Bruges. So uh, I don't think it's the coach. He was, as you mentioned, that I'm getting solid playtime uh, throughout the first half of the season. He. Mm-hmm. he wasn't quite what we used to see from him, and we know he can deliver it uh, at Bundesliga, but for some reason he wouldn't, and I think that reason might be non-football related, and it would wouldn't be far fetched. It happens. Yeah. There, well, just simply the manager just not playing him. I mean, he's in the squad, so he's just. Well, you know, I think that's the he's result. He's not being picked. Anyway. Yeah. Moving and, on. And that's quick, the quick, quick clarification. Yeah. Quick. Quick, uh, Baumgart was the assistant at, at Hansa Rostock while Sako was there. Beautiful. Yeah. By um, the way, Adam, I know you don't rate them, but they're a good club. I don't know. It's not that I don't rate them. No, no, no. I, that, that, was a, I was, that was a totally separate thing. That was me arguing that Hurant should be on the national team. We'll get there. Um, <laughs> moving on uh, to more bad news. Honestly, it doesn't seem like there's anything positive in this, in this episode. Um <laughs> That's the third point. Aventis uh, Aventisian, the left back who currently plays for Go Ahead Eagles in the Dutch Eredivisie, uh, has seemingly been dropped from the first team. Uh, We're seeing what um, I'm perceiving as a Gorman Velian situation, uh, which we will talk about him next. But um, he's all he's involved in the first team training, but he's not playing for the second team and he's not playing for the first team. He's not showing up on the first team roster. He's not showing up on the second team roster, but he's training with the first team. <laughs> Which like is six, uh, at left back, awful. Yeah. So it's 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 uh, so we we could talk about him and, and Gore at the same time. Gore Monvelian, the striker for FC Nantes, um, who has seemingly been in this limbo that would drive me crazy if I was a professional player where. 
uh, the manager, Kambula, clearly just does not rate him. I mean, he puts him on the bench half the time, and uh, the other half the time doesn't even include him in the squad. And then the times that he's on the bench, subs in everyone except for him. So it's it's mm. very frustrating here. But but as let's let's shift our perspective from the player's perspective, which is clearly one that's very. Um, uh, let's shift it to a national team perspective. Left back is a left back and center forward are two places that we need depth, not only depth, but we also need young class talent. And we have these options in Avo and in Gord. Um, Gord has already made his professional appearance. Um, but you know, w- you know, what do we as national team people? We're looking at these two players, thinking, you know, shit. If Avo was playing starting left back for at least w- one game every five games, you know, to me that's more than good enough for him to be, you know, the left back for the national team. So, w- w- what do you guys think? I'll I'll open it up to you guys. Uh, I mean, just to be to be on national team level, you gotta be playing a lot. Um, he's he's disappeared, so it doesn't make sense to call him up. Uh, but knowing Armenian football, some of the decisions just randomly happen, so. It doesn't matter what I say right now. Maybe he just gets called up, or maybe he doesn't even he doesn't even get noticed. So yeah, I mean, he did get called up in a sense that he, you know, he was brought into the squad for those two friendlies that we had against Albania and Kosovo, uh, but he didn't play because there was that that issue with the FIFA paperwork. Um, so clearly, uh, it looks like the the FFA is like they want they want to get him tied. To Hayastan. Um, not that I think Greece is trying to tie him down, <laughs> but um, not that Greece would need him. Like, not that they would need a fifth tier, uh, fifth string left back. Yeah. So he he hasn't made the Go Ahead Eagle squad since October, end of October. So it's coming up on a few months. Granted, there there was that World Cup break, but. Um, and, I mean, what what are you thinking here? Clearly, the clearly the FFA wants him in in the squad, but if he's not playing, yeah, I mean, you said it. I I, I wouldn't thought, I wouldn't play him against Turkey at all. Even if he were to get the paperwork done by then, uh, I wouldn't. It wouldn't make sense. Like the Turkey game, we're gonna need everything we got, and unfortunately, there's not much that we do have. Uh, with I mean, who who are you gonna play at left back? Who at who left would you back, play? Undoubtedly, uh, Giran Margarian. Giran Margarian. Undoubtedly, a starting and and his uh, replace as is the replacement for now. Like I am still of the opinion that the FFA should work their ass off in trying to get uh, Nayit Iknizian because he wants to play for us, and there's the Russian issue going on that with all the paperwork and stuff. So that might be a bit of a pickle to get him. Uh, in, in, in my opinion, if in my opinion, if Tiknizian, if that somehow happens, he should be starting, undoubtedly. Definitely. Yeah, undoubtedly. undoubtedly. But as we all know, there is, there are other issues at hand uh, that are preventing him and others joining. Uh, so for now, it's definitely Giro Margarian start. And I would, it, here's my gamble, uh, if Healthy and fit, um, Hago Pagopian should be the replacement because he's not long enough to play middle of the park, even though he's very talented and that's his main position. Uh, he is physically better suited for the wing, for the left back in this case. Yeah. Well, tough times ahead and a lot of questions will hopefully be answered very soon. Um, elsewhere, your boy, Armen Hovhannisyan, has made another move, this time transferring to Malta. 
Um, I, I, I mean, Armin, I don't know if you want to talk about your namesake, or <laughs> what opinions you have about this move, but the guy can't seem to find a stable club at 21. I mean, how's he going to do this for the rest of his career? Could be, bro. I mean, this comes to show that the guy was like... He was playing in Moldova, that is uh, a feeder club for uh, Romania, mm-hmm. and he was tearing it up in Moldova. He played for, the, uh, I think it was a whole year, and that was the longest uh, spell. No, wait, uh, it was in the Slovakia before that. So, yeah, bro, he had great performances, uh, first in Slovakia and then in Moldova. And for some reason, he get he keeps downgrading. Like he, and I think that's got to do with the his agents and stuff, because a guy like him, a guy as good as him, that uh, in the under nineteen tournament that was hosted in in Yerevan, where Portugal won, I think, uh, Charens, I think you were there. Uh, he played that cup, that competition for Armenia under 19, and he was mm-hmm. starting uh, non- number nine, all together with uh, Herman Kurbashan, and they were a menace. They were a threat. Like, literally, the rest of the team uh, wasn't able to hand them the ball, and they would have to defend, but they had every top tier defender, Spain, England, uh, Portugal, Italy, uh, defenders, like, they fought one on one. Yeah, so good, bro. After leaving Zimbro, he actually went to the Greek second tier uh, yeah. at, at Episcopi, and he's been loaned from them uh, to to Pieta. Um, and Episcopi, by the way, is a new team with a lot of money, uh, apparently, reportedly. Mm-hmm. Uh, he didn't win. He didn't play much. He scored a screamer against Olympiagos B. Uh, but those moves clearly seem to be about money, and I don't think he would be the one choosing in this case. So again, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about this. It doesn't doesn't uh, not 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 a good omen at at his age to be playing already moving through. How many clubs? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine clubs. I mean, it doesn't. Not a good omen. Moving on. Zlatan is like what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of looks like him. Uh, um, and he's Vada's... also tall like and fast like him. Armenian Zlatan. Yeah. <laughs> well, Armenian national team defensive duo, Varazataroyan and Hovahan Bartumian have um, have been having a little bit of a rough time in the beautiful island of Cyprus. Uh, Chadens, being our Cypriot correspondents, uh, let us know how that's going for them. Not great. Uh, what is there to say? The the Cypriot league is uh, is 14 teams, and they uh, at the end of the season they're going to be uh, divided into two parts: uh, top seven, bottom seven. And to put it into context, so you understand how bad they're doing, they're 10th, 23 points currently. Like, as of right now, they're on a nil-nil draw with a team that's sitting in 12th place. Uh, with 23 points right now, they're, they are uh, they are with a distance of uh, 11 points from the 6th position. And the 6th position has not even played yet. So... Not great, not great with the the, the players that are there, Hampartsumian and Haroyan. They have great caliber. They are they are proper national team players with huge experience, great qualities, uh, great defensive qualities. It's not looking good. So I don't know how this is gonna go. If they're gonna go to Europe, they're they're gonna have to go through the cup. That's the only way I see it. Yeah, they, they're currently sitting 10th in the league. They're actually playing right now against Doxa, um, and it's nil-nil currently. And in order to get into that top six, where I believe it's Ammonia Nicosia right now, yeah, um, correct, is in the, they're 11 points behind. Um, yes, yeah, correct. Yeah, to, to me, the issue 
looks more on the attacking front than it is on yeah, the defensive it front. Is. Um, it is, yeah. They don't know how to score. Yeah, they don't know. All their results are, um, like, 1-0, 1-0, 1-1, like, losing 1-0, 1-0, 2-0, 2-1. It's, it's, they're always very low score line. So it doesn't seem to be a defensive issue. Um, hopefully uh, that could be however, a result. This comes to show one thing I've been mentioning for the national team, how this being a team sport, uh, when one area of the pitch isn't working, and in Anorthos' case, uh, the striking area, the attackers and, and stuff, uh, uh, it translates to the rest of the team. And the Armenian national team, uh, the, the lack of defensive mids, at least for the last year. Of course, uh, we're such uh, we don't play often as national teams don't, uh, so things change quickly. But for the last year, the Armenian national team's defensive mid hasn't been working with only one uh, player being start uh, starting, and it's usually the Lion Kikorian that's old. And fatigue most of the time, and that translates it into the rest of the team not working, especially such a crowded area of the pitch where you need, like, it's critical. Uh, so hopefully things will change this year with what we're kind of we uh, have coming up next. Well, that's gonna round it up for our players abroad segment, and we will be going to our third and final portion of this episode uh, which is the biggest piece of news I think that's happened uh, since our last episode last year uh, which is Petrokov the former Ukrainian national team manager has been appointed the manager of the Armenian national team Uh, Petrokov comes with a somewhat of a winning pedigree uh, as he was the under 20 world cup champion in 2019 uh, with the Ukraine. Uh, he has gone through the entire Ukraine youth setup from under 12s all the way to the senior national team, uh, where he had a record of six wins, seven draws, and two losses, including uh, two wins versus us in the UEFA Nations League uh, for a total of an 8 nil aggregate. Um, Petrikov is known for playing the 4-3-3 formation and playing very attacking football. And he's also known for making a, cha- a lot of changes in between matches and in squads. And he's known for relying on youth talent, uh, which we know there is no shortage of in Armenia. They're just not being used. Um, his first match in charge will be on March 25th at home versus Turkey in Euro qualifiers, followed by a friendly versus Cyprus a few days later in the Edamon. Um Well, gentlemen, I'm going to open the floor to both of you. We've been waiting for a long time to see who the Football Federation of Armenia will bring in as manager. We now have that appointment in Petrikov. Um, I'll start with you, Chanens. I want to know your opinions based off the information you have now, based off what you know now. Um, and what's your, what was your initial reaction to Petrikov being signed? At first, I didn't, I didn't really understand who he was, what kind of experience he has. Um, so, in the beginning, I looked at, I looked at the, uh, you know, as we, most people do, they go on transfer market and they check uh, managerial history. I saw a lot of youth. Uh, youth managerial positions within the same team, which is Ukraine, for many years. Uh, that's like, I think, se- seven to eight years. Then I saw that he is a U20 world champion uh, in 2019. So I didn't really believe that. Uh, I had to really go and check, and it was true. So, uh, that that's the first point of showing that he can work with youth when what we've been always pushing for is youth to be presented as early as possible many many players we can name uh, i'm not going to sit down and name all of them uh, you can just follow 
all our episodes and you can understand which players we want we are referring to. Uh, the second point is his his uh, philosophy maybe or it's better to say maybe his his way of approach uh, might be very essential. Now I'm not talking about language, which is another bonus. Uh, since he speaks Russian, uh, Ukrainian, Russian, I don't want to get deep into that uh, to create conflict. Um, he knows how to talk uh, with the language. But for me, what it was important is that when I looked at, uh, when I tried to research about him, uh, there were a few news reports on a few things he said in a press conference, which somewhat should not have been said uh, in the way that he meant it, but the, the the meaning behind it of those things that he said, uh, which was regarding the conflict uh, with Ukraine and Russia, uh, he he showed that he can he can motivate and encourage players in the tough times and especially if he's going to work with youth players that needs to be transferred very well young players need to digest what they what they see and what they are doing on the pitch this is how they're going to grow and i really hope he's going to bring them forth as early as possible even in the first game if they start if, if he starts working on that i really wouldn't have a problem if we're going to start with this approach, we might as well try it and see how it goes. Armin? Oh, I, initially, I loved it, and I still do. I mean, uh, it's long story short, a uh, short answer is uh, it's a great uh, choice. Uh, I was honestly surprised because I, <laughs> I was not expecting a good position, especially coming off having uh, Berezovsky as caretaker, which was, in my opinion, the worst uh, national team goalkeeper, goalkeeping coach that I've seen. Uh, and also before that, uh, precisely the, in, the, the the time when he was uh, goalie's coach, goalkeeping coach, uh, was the awful in results, in terms of results and performances. Uh, it's interesting that you guys mention youth. Uh, it's one of the many, many virtues that uh, Petrakov is going to be bringing with him. Uh, and he does follow uh, Kaparos's, uh mentality, even though that didn't show, in the quite show uh, over the, the last uh, year of 2022. Uh, but if you guys remember in the audience, we certainly do here at FK, uh, Caparros' first half uh, of his entire spell, like from March 2020 until uh, May, June 2021. That first half of the Zera, of the Caparros era, it was awesome. The results were awesome. The performances were awesome because, and in relation to, the youth was one of the focuses for Cap, for the coach. Uh, he wasn't afraid of playing the youth. He was on a play, afraid of uh, playing in form debutants like rookies that were in form. Uh, again, linking to what I was mentioning earlier, the importance of having good quality players that are also in form. Um, unfortunately, things changed then on, and for some reason, he started to use the excuse of experience quote unquote, and called washed up players that some were not even good to begin with. But I expect things to change at least for a while again now. Hopefully this will pave the way for more uh, systemic and stable improvements because as we know in Armenian football things do improve sometimes but they don't last. Well, hopefully this does change that and makes things a little more stable in a good way. Uh, the Turkey game is going to be super interesting because of everything, literally. 
Uh, and it's also his first game. Squad list is going to basically define everything. Like right? All of our opinions will be uh, based on that first squad list, whenever that is. Yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to give our thoughts now because, like you said, we can look at the squad in in March and we could say, oh, it's gonna be the same shit, you know. Um, yeah. But you know, I'm I'm really interested to see how this is gonna. Two year contract though. Yeah, ooh, ooh, ooh. yeah, it's a two year. Well, he doesn't stay anywhere for really more than a year, but uh, clearly it seems like Euro the Euros is the goal and. If if the FFA is know. serious about this, I don't well, know I mean, that it's, that's the it's case, always the, it's always the goal. It's, no, it's always yeah, the goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's national that's football. We know. National football. Be. It should be. It's not like World Cup is uh, World Cup. Of, of of course, would be big, but you know, Euros is always, we kind of see yeah, Euros more practical. The, Look, it, always even the next Petrikov, game is what. Yeah, always the next game is the the most important one. Uh, we always want to qualify for the the upcoming uh, tournament. It, mm-hmm. That's what you tell uh, the outside world. But if I'm reading between the lines as I usually do, this move, Petrakov, like appointing Petrakov and not some other coach, uh, a youth-based play, uh, coach, uh, appointing him for two-year contract, not just one, as usually the national team does, in this case, it's going to be a two-year contract. Uh, this gives me the idea that it's clearly going to be a rather youth-developing uh, focus. Of I, course, I, if we I do completely qualify, disagree. Of course, if we do qualify for something, it's going to be huge. I'm just saying, uh, I think Medic Pekian is doing a good job in focusing on the long term and setting more solid ground. See, but the thing is, a national team isn't club. You you can't think of it that way. You have to think of, it's a results based thing. There's no league table. There's not. There's none of that. You're either playing in major tournaments or you're not playing in major tournaments. And Armenia is not playing in major tournaments. And the goal is always to play in major tournaments. Or else, why are you playing as a national team? And Petrikov well, understands uh, that. That, yeah. But for that, you need a project. For that you need. I agree. Good players, players that are well, we do, we solid do have experience. A, we do have a project, and it has been implemented, and it's it has been implemented. It's what been uh, how many years has it been since? Um, why am I blanking out? But since the Spanish contingency originally came yeah. in, yeah, pre pre Copados improvements. Yeah, 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 I know what you mean. It's, uh, it's going to take another. It's going to take another five. This. Yeah, Melendez. It's going to take another five to eight years for us to start to see the 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 the, the things from that. But there there is a project. But the current national team conundrum is is you know we had a string of very good results. We were still unable to qualify for a major tournament. And at some point, as a as a football federation, you got to ask yourself, okay, why are we playing if we're not why are we playing if we're just going to be sec- last place or second to last place in every table? Sure, Nations League was great. It was it was very nice to to see us win something, quote unquote. You know, we, we got that promotion to League <laughs> B. Uh, it was it was amazing. Um, but the, but the next logical step is okay. If we can do that, we need to be able to do this. And at the end of the day, that's why people play national team. People don't play national team uh, to play in the Nations League. People play national team because they want to represent Armenia in the Euros and in the World Cup. Of and course, but what happens on the pitch comes from what happens off the pitch. Off the pitch. And, well, and for and, that, and, we mentioned meritocracy. For that, we talked about, like, I think the episode was called What Went Wrong? <laughs> like, essentially an in-depth <laughs> analysis of what went wrong. And we know what happened. Like, literally, we've listed one by one everything that went wrong. As I said, like, we need stability. We need, we don't, we, you mentioned something very interesting that we were doing really good and some uh, suddenly it, uh, we failed to qualify. I see it as like 
the the federation and the national team as a whole uh, backtracking on its own progress. That's what I was going into. Like we need that progress you mentioned. I mentioned we need that progress that we all know of and 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 want for the national mm -hmm. team to be stable. And I don't think that's achievable uh, in a short term basis because we see and we saw and we see again over and over and over again. Uh, how easily things can vanish if like you don't sub, like if you don't keep uh, your position all your progress and i think that's what this uh medikvikian is aiming for by appointing uh petraco like off the pitch meritocracy well uh, let's hope so because petrakov even said in um his uh, one of his pre-match press conferences, I believe it was in the uh, World Cup qualifiers playoffs first game that Ukraine played. He said that uh, international football is a results based business and he knows that it does not matter what's going on. You need to win. So let's hope yeah, we can carry that mentality. Say. Let's hope we can carry I, that mentality. I, yeah. I well, like him. I, I like like. Everything that mentality, that like his youth development, I think it's gonna be very positive for us. Even if we don't qualify, like don't go crazy if we don't qualify for the whatever the next thing is. I'm saying focus on the progress and the long term. Uh, I would much rather, bro. I would much rather have an entirely merit-based, like good squad. And good team playing, and uh, I don't know, felt falling just short, and and getting draws and draw here and draw there, uh, and have a solid motivated core team for the upcoming season, uh, than having a lucky uh, a stroke, and winning a game you're not supposed to win by playing bad, filled with awful players like many we know of and have them represent us at the big stages and then humiliate, get humiliated like it has happened. I would much rather have all of the scum, all of the, the what is not worth of the national team, leave, retire, be set aside, I don't know, you name it, whatever. I would much rather have a team I'm proud of. And I think that is a good idea Medic Pekian is focusing on. And that's why he appointed Petraco. Well, we need filtering. We need filtering of the squads. Oh, tell me about I it. Agree. A lot of yeah, it. Big time. And we need to start calling up some of these damn youth players. We need, we need. Uh, I will argue, Hodant needs to be in the national team picture. I will argue yeah. this to the end of time. <laughs> you want to go there? Uh, Armin and I have argued about this off, off the show that uh, you need... You need the Hurats, you need the Stiopas, the yes. Seropians, the Charoyans, uh, Gorelov, the Tiknesians. You need the you need to bring the best out of Bichakchan and Spertian. These are eight I just named eight players that can be the core of this team for the next ten years. They Definitely need yeah. they need to be the focal point. Petrikov what? needs to make a squad that it has youth at its spine, our most I talented can't. youth. And you I need to you build from there. <laughs> Bro, I'm just saying, you can't do that against Turkey. Like, luckily, we have two games. Yeah, of against course. Cyprus. Turkey, bro, you need to go full on. Like, uh, every fit, experienced, informed player. Uh, yeah, see, but that's not, but that's not what, but, 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 but what, you, good, what experience means to you and what experience means to national team is very different because experience uh, to national team means you're playing, uh, you're playing, 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 which that's, bro, that's, I'm, they will eat us alive if they're I know, I'm playing. not saying that. You said it. I, I mean, experience in our perspective, like proven quality plays. Oh, I, I forgot to see. mention something uh, on transfer market. Uh, I saw that he commonly plays with 4-3-3. I don't yeah. know if he's going to play like that, attacking 4-3-3. I don't know if he's going to play like that. But, uh, you know, like when we started the podcast, I was dreaming this of 
I was dreaming of this uh, uh, this 4-3-3 attacking Armenian national team scoring goals and such. I'm just saying, let's see what what will come up. It's just it's just a point I forgot to mention before. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I hope so because how many talented wingers do we have? We have we have Bichakchan, we have Shao uh, we have Bar I mean, we have Babayan. Yeah, yeah, but that's a managerial kind of thing. Like a manager can break down. We cannot do that really because there's a tactical perspective to that four through three. I mean, we can say all the players won and we can you know put them on a field, but it doesn't mean that they're gonna complete it's the true. plan of that formation or of that I game. Mean, we can we can speculate, uh, and I think it's important to keep our heads because we can speculate, and in many cases we even know which players would be more helpful than the the federation does, or at, even if they do for some reason, sometimes they don't do the best thing for the national team. We we don't know what happens there. We we're not a, a part of it, so we can't talk about that. But we can speculate as to which player can deliver where, what player can do what. Uh, but we have like two full months for that. Two light bulb game against Turkey. Yeah, light, light bulb. Tell me. So whoever's listening, um, you should do this. UDM football Gentron, uh, and you say you say that you're in for an episode specifically for us to design and say who which players should be called up and where they should be playing. So a, a whole different style of uh, of of planning. So instead of us just going saying who will is likely to get called up, we just start making this kind of like a fantasy team of uh, yeah. the next few games, let's say. Uh, if you if we get a lot of DMs and this episode gets shared a lot, then we'll do it. That's an interesting Ooh. idea. Challenge like, to the listeners. A fantasy, a fantasy Armenian national team uh, squad list. Well... That was our last topic of this episode, and that is going to be concluding this episode of Football Gentron. Uh, it is January, going into February already, and the national team picks up again in March. Uh, APL will be back in around February's time, probably by our, our next episode or so. Um, and, yeah, that's it. Anything else to add, gentlemen? Probably by the time this episode drops, there, <laughs> there's going to be some news. <laughs> That might make us look like complete fools and, and oh, change probably. everything as usual. Uh, it always happens. It always happens. <laughs> but enjoy the ride, guys. It's going to be one hell of a year. It is. Yep. All right. Well, well, that's it for here on Football Genshin. Thanks for listening. Peace. Peace. Okay, thanks. Mwah. <laughs>